And so the topic of today's panel is the absolute state of money. Um, we're going to come from it from a few different perspectives, taking advantage of some of their different backgrounds. Um, uh, Patrick is going to address a little bit of, of some of the history of the Fed. And particularly, I think what's interesting right now is that you know, the number one issue in America today is inflation. Um, and it's, it's, you know, there's no solutions out there being talked about in the political landscape. You get some lip service from Republicans saying, oh, we're going to cut spending. Uh, and then they give, you know, $50 billion to Ukraine. Um, so, you know, this is one of those areas where there has been a void, I think, in serious discussion of this issue. And something obviously, you know, us as Austrians, this is a, an area that we can fill. Um, and so, you know, that, that intersection of, of money and politics, there's a historical perspective here um, that uh, Dr. Newman's going to provide. Um, so, Patrick, if you want to start on off. Oh, sure. Should I the, go with it? Go whatever, whatever you prefer. Yeah. All right. Oh. Prices over the past 12 months, uh, since April of last year, have really gone up uh, much quicker than what people thought they would, uh, much quicker than people, what people estimated. Um, the economists, the government, the White House has continually underestimated the uh, extent of this inflationary problem. Um, inflation hit a high of 8.5% year over year in March. Slightly came down uh, this week. The numbers for April are about 8.3%. This was higher than what, uh, I guess you could say, the establishment forecast at 8.1%. So this is, this, is, this is a big problem, right? Because right now everyone's worried about rising interest rates. Uh, for those of you who participate in the stock market, uh, the past couple months has been uh, a rude wake-up call, you can say. Um, and it, 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 people are now worrying more and more about uh, recession. The odds of a recession, economists forecast uh, last April is about 10%. Now it's at 30%. Okay, and we all remember the run-up to the housing bubble uh, when they said, "No, there's nothing wrong. There's no recession. This is not going to happen." And then everything uh, fell apart. So, judging by the track record of economists. Uh, missing the inflation boat, they'll probably miss the recession boat as well, for reasons that I'll talk about um, in a little bit. So why have prices been rising? All right. Well, we're, we're good Austrians here, so we know that prices have been rising due to this enormous increase in uh, capitalist greed. Right? As we've been told, apparently there's producers, corporations have gotten much more greedy over the past couple months and they've been jacking up prices. This is, of course, if you're reading a Robert Reich uh, you know, um, uh, op-ed or uh, something from uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren. Uh, there's something now in the House. Uh, the House will vote on basically price controls for gasoline. So it's good to know that we've learned nothing since the 1970s. Um, <laughs> but of course, we know the real reason for the increase in the money supply. And it's the subject of the talk today. It's, it's money. We've printed an incredible amount of money over the past two years. Money supply growth for 2020 was 25%. For 2021, it was over 12%. We haven't seen an annual growth rate that high, even just 12% since the 1970s. Coincidentally, when there was high inflation. And this has been due to the same old um, uh, reasons governments have been spending more money. We had to uh, print a bunch of money during the COVID uh, uh, lockdowns, finance the government. We've been increasing the money supply, or the Federal Reserve has been increasing the money supply in different ways since 2008. And this has been driving up uh, prices, right? And the Fed, the White House, everyone thought that these price rises wouldn't occur. Then they started to occur and they said, well, it's gonna be transitory. Okay, then they turned transitory to episodic. Then they said, well, it's gonna be concentrated in goods. There's no inflation in services. Bear in mind, services inflation has been increasing rapidly over the past couple months, worrying a lot of people. So again, 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 they're wrong. Okay, and now we've been told that, well, the Federal Reserve will an engineer the Goldilocks. Right, the, the Goldilocks end to the business cycle, which is the soft landing. They're going to get rid of inflation from 8%. It's going to go down to 2%, and unemployment's actually going to continue to go down. So we're told. So it's like, wow, well, this is a great, this, is, this, this sounds amazing. And what's also interesting is that since the beginning of inflation increasing, inflation's always going to moderate dra dra drastically by the fall of, two, of 2022. Okay, there's some mysterious event occurring in the fall of 2022 where prices are going to now be under control and the economy is going to be great. 
All right, and of course, this is the elephant in the room uh, that's uh, now becoming a bigger and bigger issue is the midterms, okay? Because there's a myth that since the Fed's founding, it's independent, okay? That the Fed is outside of political uh, discussions and you know, it's, it's free of special interest influence, and that's a lie. Okay, from the beginning, the Fed has been a crony institution beholden to New York banks. Uh, Jay Powell, for example, he was a former partner at the Carlyle Group, one of the world's largest private equity firms. Well, isn't that a little interesting that all of his immense money printing caused enormous bonuses for Wall Street? You know, uh, the, 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 the connection is so clear. But the Federal Reserve is becoming incredibly politicized. Um, Janet Yellen, Biden's Secretary of the Treasury, so a former uh, Fed chair, Jay Powell, an Obama, uh, Obama appointee to the Board of Governors. Um, he recently just got reconfirmed as of some of Biden's new appoint appointments. So the Federal Reserve doesn't actually want to contract significantly before the midterms because it's going to hurt the Democrats. Right? And we've seen this before in history, most notably about literally 50 years ago, 1972, when Richard Nixon pressured Arthur Burns to keep, um, the, keep the economy hot in time for his reelection. Okay? So the Fed is going to contract, but they're hoping they only have to do it a little bit. They're just gonna take credit for any sort of price fall that might occur from supply shocks easing, and then anything difficult they'll do after the election if they need to but their hand could easily be forced before the election, okay? Uh, we've already seen a huge correction occurring in the stock market, right? Inflation is looking like it's going to be very persistent. Um, there's worries now that it's going to start to affect the labor market. The economy contracted, gross domestic product contracted last quarter. Uh, so all we need is one more quarter and then we're officially in a recession, the recession that everyone said wouldn't occur. So, you know, there, there, we, there we go, we're halfway there, right? Uh, conditions aren't looking good. Conditions are pointing more and more towards stagflation, okay? Uh, it could be not as bad as the 70s. It could be just as bad as the 70s. It could also be worse than the 70s. America is in a position which is much harder to deal with stagflation than before. So this is sort of the, the, uh, the, the problem that we face and I think it's a very serious problem. I think we're looking for, we've got to look forward to some turbulence in the markets uh, in the coming months, in the coming year. But I know that a great uh, way out of this mess is, is if every politician and every Federal Reserve uh, official read uh, Bob Murphy's new uh, textbook. So again, I just want to say uh, thanks so much for, for listening and congratulations. And I hope we have a nice uh, meetup today. And then obviously one of the areas that has benefited from heightened awareness of concerns about uh, the banking system, the dollar, everything, has been the crypto industry. Though, though recent news there has been turbulent a little bit as well. Um, so Demelza, if you want to talk a little bit uh, from, from that perspective um, with, with your, your experience in the crypto uh, sphere. Sure. Okay. Well, since we're standing up to do this, <laughs> I'm also going to stand up. Uh, so uh, you might not know me. So my name is Demelza Hayes, and I was a 2014 uh, Mises Summer Fellow. And even back then, my, my research topic was on Bitcoin. And uh, I'm lucky that I grew up in the libertarian space because I read the libertarian Reddit and found out about Bitcoin early on, um, 2013. And, you know, basically... Uh, I'm not going to get into the debate whether it's money or not, but I will say that normally I would think money shouldn't make you rich. And Bitcoin made a lot of people rich the last decade. So I'm not, you know, I'm not going to say it's, it's not money, but um, it, it's very volatile. It's a very volatile asset. And, um, it, you know, there's, there's lots of ways that, that people are working now to use what's called a stable coin on top of Bitcoin. So basically, you know, uh, there's, there's ways to send Bitcoin through the blockchain. And there's something called the Lightning Network, which is basically trying to bring down fees and uh, increase the speed of transactions of Bitcoin. But still, people don't want to spend their Bitcoin because the price of Bitcoin could go up, right? It's, it's the supply of it is fixed at 21 million. And every year, the uh, inflation rate, the daily inflation rate uh, drops. Every four years, it, that amount drops in half. So if you have this, you know, kind of 
uh, deflationary asset, you don't really want to spend it. Um, I mean, I know, of course, you know, in the Austrian economics literature, we, we do discuss how eventually you have to consume. You know, even on a gold standard, you eventually have to consume and you buy the asset, you buy the laptop that you want. You don't just wait for the price to drop every year and never consume. So you do spend with your deflationary assets, but people would prefer to spend dollars. You know, they would prefer to spend the inflationary asset. So, you know, a lot of uh, people would rather take out debt in fiat and put their savings in a deflationary asset like cryptocurrencies. So, um, yeah, sorry, a little, a little back up about me. I am the director of research at Cointelegraph. We're the largest uh, media company in the digital asset space. And uh, I'm also a fund manager. So I managed a crypto fund from 2017 to 2019. Then I uh, left that company and now I've just launched a new one um, based out of Switzerland. And I've lived in Switzerland for the last seven years, well, actually Liechtenstein, but um, it's a close neighbor to Switzerland that most people have heard of here. Um, and my, you know, I don't have a structured speech like uh, Patrick did, but basically, you know, I was, uh, though kind of said, let's talk about the US versus Europe. And my feeling is that the US entrepreneurs are scared. They, they don't want to go into the cryptocurrency space because um, they're scared the SEC is going to come down on them or they're going to be regulated somehow very tightly. Uh, and that's actually been the case. So a lot of companies in the cryptocurrency space in the U.S. have gotten in trouble with the SEC. It depends what trouble means to you. Are you willing to just pay a fine and continue to do your business, uh, which is kind of what's happened so far? Um, but there are other, uh, you know, risks in the U.S. Uh, you know, for example, even some entrepreneurs have released a decentralized software code, uh, which is not a, a company. They've not made a company. It's a decentralized code that operates without, you know, them uh, doing anything after day one. So the day one they release the code into the Internet, people can use it however they want. And they don't have to do anything else to that code to, you know, be the company driving its growth or innovation. And so it's called, it's basically called decentralized, uh, you know, software. And that, even that is now have class action lawsuits against the developers that wrote that code. So in the U.S. So, you know, my experience here is that Switzerland and Liechtenstein and Dubai, there's a ton of capital going to these places, um, a lot of entrepreneurs, even the companies that are, you know, have Americans in them, they set up their headquarters in the Bahamas or uh, Singapore or Switzerland. So, I mean, I see actually a brain drain from the U.S., out of the U.S., which is, is shocking because, I, you know, I think the U.S., out of my experience living in like three continents and 10 countries. I think the US has one of the strongest labor forces in terms of skill set. Each individual in the US and how skilled they are, their ability to just, you know, uh, uh, you know be competent and, and, and uh, you know, read and write and, and get, get a good job, you know, do a good job on what they are tasked with. And I see a big brain drain. One thing is like the crypto, com the crypto community in the U.S. is kind of targeting Austin, Texas and Miami, Florida. Those are the two regions where cryptocurrency is really big um, in terms of entrepreneurs. And uh, most of them still have their headquarters in the Bahamas. You know, so, so they're not like they're, they're trying as much as possible to work in the U.S. as, you know, and, and be. But, but actually everything official is going outside of the U.S. and, you know, as much as possible. So. Going forward, you know, I think that the U.S. is going to continue to have a brain drain and, and, and capital drain as well, also capital, um, you know, as long as the SEC and FINRA and, uh, you know, the CFTC, as long as they always come down hard on the cryptocurrency companies. Um, right now, FTX is a large cryptocurrency exchange and they're trying to compete with the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in order to basically uh, reduce intermediaries when trading options and to make it you know, more available to retail investors. And the government's not having it. I mean, CFTC is not gonna allow FTX to start trading uh, options on all sorts of assets. Um, there's, just, there's just hard stops in the road towards, you know, uh, kind of financial freedom now in the U.S. And 
you know, listening to Dr. Robert Higgs years ago, I, he said have a mobile, mobile uh, skill set and kind of, you know, get out of the country. And that's basically what I did. If you live abroad and you're married, you, you have a $200,000 per year foreign earned income exclusion, which I took advantage of. You don't have to pay taxes in the U.S. when you're married and abroad, up to 200000 per year. And then, you know, when I came back here, I got hit with a huge tax bill, and definitely it impacts my standard of living, right? Because if I'm living here and I have to pay 30 40% to the government, including everything, you know, all the taxes when you add them up, uh, it's, it's, it's really stifling for my own investment. I can't invest in my friend's company or startup or, you know, an innovative idea that I might have because I've paid off my money to the government. So I, you know, I, um, I think the beauty, though, of this technology is that if you're willing to break the rules, you, you, have, you have complete freedom. I mean, if you want to take your life into your own hands and be responsible for yourself and you don't care if you're breaking the rules, this technology allows you to do that. Um, but, you know, I, I think that if you still, you know, want to have your assets in the U.S. and you're not willing to leave your family on a plane and get out of the country and, you know, it's, it's here it's very strict. So I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, it's, it's been a tough move for me to move back to the U.S. and to see just how the cryptocurrency community is different here um, from, from Europe. But yeah, overall, I mean, we, we can discuss later on about money and, and whether Bitcoin's money or not. I'd say, you know, it's a good, it, it, I'm not gonna say it's a good investment, I can't say that. Um, it, it, it's, it's more of an investment for me. I, I would never use it as money. I used it as money once, which is what they say. They say, oh, we need everybody to spend Bitcoin. I spent it once on a hair blow dryer in 2016, and today, that price of that hair blow dryer is $25,000. So, <laughs> Never again will I ever spend Bitcoin ever again for me. That's, that was it. So I'm not spending Bitcoin as money. It's for me, it's my digital gold. So, okay. Thanks a lot for having me. And, and then next up, someone who could talk perhaps a little bit about the uh, center for a lot of the, the, that pain that you're suffering uh, from the Beltway. Uh, Peter, again, I think it's a reflection of positive trends that, that we have some Mises Institute people embedded within heritage now, so I'm very excited about. But uh. Uh, No, I was stunned when uh, uh, Heritage hired me. I was like, did they look at my background? Do they know, do they know about Mises? Uh, and by the way, Heritage has a new populist president who refers to our current um, government as the Biden regime. So... Uh, his very first talk to the organization, uh, that caused a stir in the room. Half of us were cheering, the other half were not as happy. Uh, okay, a theme in Patrick and Demelz's remarks so far uh, has been that our country does have enormous potential, obviously. Uh, to a large extent, the past 200 years has been the American centuries. Uh, we have dominated technology, uh, everything, culture, <laughs> trends, sometimes for worse. Um, we have enormous potential. We have the workforce, the resources, legal, financial infrastructure, uh, but this potential is threatened. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that threat. Uh, we are located up in Mordor, land of uh, volcanoes and permanent night. Uh, in fact, we're located steps from the abyss. We can literally see it spew forth with the smoke from the top of the capital. Uh, so one of my favorite uh, memes is the weak man hard times meme. Uh, and it, it's on my profile over on Elon Musk's uh, new toy. Uh, it's actually millennia old. Uh, Polybius described it as kiklos, uh, the, the political cycle. And the trick, of course, is to make the good times long and frequent and the bad times really short. Right? It is inevitable that you will have this cycle of good and bad. You know, the uh, good makes people uh, take things for granted. They don't fight as hard uh, against the erosion. Um, but there is hope, right? You can either stretch it out, uh, or if the bad times uh, do come, uh, you want to make them very short. Now, for the first time in many of our lives, uh, many of us, I think, do feel like we're standing on the edge of those hard times, uh, the edge of a very tall cliff, a uh, long ways down. We do have all the hallmarks of the 1970s. Uh, inflation, I, I agree with Jeff and with uh, some of the speakers, it is certainly hitting double digits. They're playing games largely with shelter. 
Uh, so at least 10 to 12 percent, possibly higher. Uh, the economy appears very healthy on the outside, uh, but once you crack the surface, there's, there's worms inside. Uh, GDP strength is largely a statistical illusion from the long lockdowns, sort of releasing it little by little. Uh, if you actually look back to the trend before COVID hit, we're nowhere near. Uh, we're still, we're, we're about 5 million jobs down, which, you know, as a percentage basis, uh, that would drive unemployment to 6 7%. Uh, the, you know, we have millions of people who specifically dropped out of the labor market. Many of them are being paid to stay at home. Meanwhile, things are breaking one after the next. Uh, we've had clogged ports now for about seven months. Uh, they have not gotten better. The media has found other things to talk about, but they continued. One of my favorite examples out of that, uh, many of you might remember a few months ago, they had something like 100 ships off the coast of Los Angeles. And all the news reports had pictures, right? People would go up on the hills and they would take a picture of all the ships out there. So what they did was they didn't fix it and actually got worse, they instituted a system where the ships have to ask for a ticket, like a place in line, and they have to do that back in Shanghai. So now what the ships do is they just, they just drive slow. Okay, so they steam, you know, you can save money by, by running your ship slow. So rather than being off the coast of LA, they're now distributed all the way back to Shanghai. So they play games. Uh, we've got new surprises uh, really every week. We've got baby formula at the moment uh, running out. Uh, there's chatter about blood pressure medicines, medical images for cancer screenings. Uh, it's just one thing after the next is breaking. And moreover, even that illusion, even that illusion of prosperity uh, is fading. So Jerome Powell, he's already announced uh, that he's going to sacrifice the economy to ramp up rates. He seems to think that he it won't have to hurt too much uh, because he believes, um, but he has already told us he's, he's going to deliver the bust after the boom. Uh, put it together and we are facing the 1970s. We even have the riots, we have the urban decay, we have the uh, FBI arresting protesters. It's almost a complete trifecta. In fact, we are arguably in a substantially more dangerous place than the 1970s for money because in the 50 years since Carter, we built astounding levels of debt. Total debt in the U.S. is up to 88 trillion as a nation. This is not counting the unfunded liabilities uh, that government has promised. That 88 trillion is 1.1 million per family of four. That's for the <laughs> for for the average American. That is um, insane. It's 370 percent of GDP. That's up from 1.5 trillion in 1970, the last time we were here. Uh, by the way, it's up 35 trillion since 2008. Uh, for the government, of course, it's even worse. You've got the 30 trillion in public debt. You've got the unfunded liabilities. Even the public number for the debt is about 100 times higher than it was in 1970. Our population is about twice as big. So the government feasts, you starve. Put it together and Powell is a deer frozen in the headlights, right? He talks about Volcker, how much he respects Volcker for his bravery. Uh, but he feels uh, unable to do this, right? He, he keeps talking about inflation as if, if it comes, it, it's already here, it's, it's, it's tearing off our legs. Uh, but Powell keeps talking about how maybe someday we'll need to go Volcker. And he knows that he can't dream of it. It would potentially be 2008 on crack, right? You would have this, the, the inflation, the increasing stagnation, which Powell is going to deliver, and then you combine that now with a financial crisis. Uh, they've already got a taste of that uh, with the taper tantrum in 2013 when they started uh, threatening to pull liquidity out. Uh, another ghost in the machine surprised them in 2019 in, in uh, repo markets. In some, they're terrified. Uh, they don't know what's going to jump out if they try to fix it, and the storm is already here. The best they've got is excuses. So they've got the intellectual bodyguard uh, in media conjuring up new scapegoats. They've got Putin, COVID. Uh, voters who uh, need to spend trillions on unicorn farts, uh, which will make energy free. So what got us here? So governments in the 19, or governments in general, they deliver this kind of crisis uh, for the same reason drug addicts steal your television. It's, it's, it's in their nature. They have the power, they can spend, they can you know, control, they can uh, chase sound bites and um, sacrifice the economy on the way there, and so they do it. Uh, but what, of course, used to happen is that the money stopped it, right? At some point, your gold would start draining out. There was some constraint on this irresponsibility. 
Now, of course, it doesn't. Now, Reagan, to his credit, he did put the fiat sword away, right? The 1970s ended. Uh, <laughs> Carter, I think, unintentionally had a big part of it, but Reagan kept with it. Uh, but he never pounded that fiat sword back into, into gold, into something that would actually act as a constraint. So now, by the time we get to Trump, gold was so outside the Overton window, it was so outside of mainstream thought, that the very few who even understood what a gold standard did were kooks. Uh, in fact, under the COVID regime, we saw the ultimate argument against fiat in the form of the lockdowns. Right? Those would never have happened if we didn't have a fiat regime. Just imagine, right? a bureaucrat, he's contemplating a 50% reduction in tax revenue okay, from lockdowns. He would say, it's impossible, it can't be done. He'd be thinking of the millions of bureaucrats who are going to lose their jobs, all the budgets that are going to be cut. Nope, impossible. It's unrealistic. It would have never happened. So fiat bought that lockdown. You bought it, courtesy of the Federal Reserve. All right, so that's the bad news. Uh, where do we stand today? I'm actually extraordinarily optimistic uh, because I think we have a heck of a moment. Uh, first, we have the best opportunity in a generation to radically transform money, possibly even better than the 1970s. Um, things like Bitcoin did not exist in 1970s. There were, there were people trying to make them by the 1990s, but they kept getting hunted down by men with guns. Uh, in Washington, the mood is indeed changing very fast. Uh, when I joined about a year ago, I was told gold and Bitcoin are fringe, don't bother, it's weird. Uh, now we're getting questions about it from like Senate candidates want to know what's up with the Fed, what is the Fed doing, are they going to wreck everything? Uh, there has been a huge shift. Um, we're actually throwing a Bitcoin-only event, which is the first time for us. It, it's really, I think, the first time for a large uh, mainstream think tank in Washington. Uh, we've got senators from both parties trying to speak there. Um, there is a big move. Uh, so what changed? Two things. Number one, inflation, obviously. Number two, financial censorship. Uh, voters can see the inflation with their own eyes. They're angry. We don't even have to make them angry. <laughs> we just have to run with it. Uh, it's the single biggest voter issue, as Patrick mentioned. That's cross-party. For Democrats, global warming is almost up there with inflation. But for all the sane people, it is by far the number one issue. Uh, and the inflation keeps throwing up these crises, baby formula, whatever horror comes next. And then there's that other big driver, financial censorship. So libertarians and conservatives feel hunted. We are hunted. Ask a Canadian truck driver, uh, a J6 um, participant. Uh, even moderates are coming over. So Joe Rogan, Jordan Peterson, Elon Musk, these guys were left. They, they, they call themselves left. They are being red-pilled or uh, gold-pilled, I guess, um, from a libertarian perspective. So people are coming over. They're, they're coming over en masse. Uh, if you just look at the approval numbers of Biden, the entire information industry of the regime is dedicated to, to apologizing for this guy. None of it's working. Uh, so it's very um, encouraging. People, for the first time, are not believing what they're told. Uh, now, I do love gold. Uh, I generally prefer Bitcoin simply because gold is centralized. It needs a bank. A hard bank, yes, but still a bank. And a bank has an address, and men with guns can go to addresses and visit them and make them do things. So the financial censorship has specifically moved the needle towards Bitcoin, which, as Demelza mentioned, remains um, speculative. Uh, the main bet when you're buying Bitcoin is you're betting whether it will become a common money. And that's an unknown factor, and that unknowability fluctuates a lot day by day. Uh, so don't necessarily park the kids' college fund in it. Um, the point is that there is a lot of attention moving towards those kinds of decentralized systems that are invulnerable to the state. Uh, Caitlin Long's expression, it doesn't have a throat to choke. Uh, so that is sort of the middle finger that is bringing, of course, a lot of people in our movement. So I'll wrap up. In sum, inflation is putting hard money front and center. Financial censorship is putting Bitcoin, or at least decentralized currencies, front and center. Uh, the earth is moving politically. The stablecoin thing is going to get traction. Warren, Gensler at SEC are, are trying to push that. It's a question of reserves. The reserves were lousy quality. This is pretty simple. Um, but anyway, we'll see what they get out of that, but it's probably going to be relatively minor. Uh, if, uh, at any rate, so that is the battle. Hard money, decentralization, power back to the people. If we win, we stop the cycle. The hard times delayed, possibly reversed. We have reversed them before. We have certainly delayed them. 
right? The Carter years gave us Reagan, gave us roughly 30 years of prosperity. Even <laughs> Clinton was economically, you know, he was nowhere near the previous Democrats. If we really win, if we succeed in killing fiat and using that to leverage massive amounts of power back to the people, we can think big, right? If we think of the dark days of Lincoln, okay, you had hyperinflation, you had, it was really a dictatorship. Uh, that then went into the golden age, the gilded age, the golden age of the Victorian uh, era in America. It was arguably humanity's greatest era in just about every way, and that, that was only you know, 20 years after Lincoln. It is possible. We can dream. It has happened. We've done it before. If we fail, we fall into the cycle that marches on. The weak men make harder times, economic depression, national bankruptcy, a regression to a time when survival was not taken for granted. Uh, it's not all bad. The pink-haired crowd will have to get jobs. They'll sober up. Um, a bankrupt government stops micromanaging small business, doesn't have the money. Uh, it even stops chasing down vigilantes, so that's interesting to explore. Uh, but it'll be a very hard couple of decades without a, da without a doubt, with many victims, uh, some of them who will be our friends. Um, so this is the battle, and I do believe that hard money is the canon. Well, after a lot of the, the doom and gloom from uh, the, the first two uh, uh, talks there, I was going to ask for some optimism, and so I'm, I'm glad, Peter, you, you already came in there. So I'm going to double down on, on the doom and gloom again then. Um, if, if, I, I think one of the things that's become clear is that the regime you know, it recognizes the degree to which you know, the, the next frontiers of political warfare are in the banking industry. You, know, you, you mentioned uh, the way that American banks conspired with you know, crushing dissent in the U.S., Canadian truckers. Um, you know, we, we've seen the way that the, the money system has been used with the uh, uh, Russia and the Ukraine situation for, for geopolitics. Um, wh what are your fears about, you know, if, if we're seeing positive populist trends, we're seeing people recognize the state for what it is in, in increasing areas, what, what scares you the most on how this moment of crisis could turn even worse than what it is now, rather than creating opportunities for kind of depoliticizing money, if anyone wants to start. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, well, I, I, I'm worried that no one will learn from, <laughs> from this experience, which seems to be a running uh, theme. Again, I'll just reiterate, we've, there's, there's a bill in the House, at least, the uh, Congress is going to vote on for, again, cutting down on exploitative price gouging of gasoline companies. Right, so this is the the threat of price ceilings uh, preventing gasoline uh, companies, gas stations from raising uh, the price at the pump. This is a very visible sign of inflation due to consumers. This is something that uh, both parties are very concerned about, especially the Democrats. So we could easily just be there. There's a significant amount of the, the population that yes does believe inflation has been due to greedy corporations. Uh, and it's price gouging, and it's taking advantage of people, and they would support price ceilings with uh, no ra no understanding that price ceilings cause shortages, long lines. We did this before in the 1970s. Uh, Richard Nixon price controls, Gerald Ford, win, whip inflation now, the long lines gas for Jimmy Carter. So we could see the, the same mistakes uh, being repeated and thinking that the problem is due to something outside of the Federal Reserve. It's due to outside of having a central bank in control of our money. Uh, that's what I'm worried about, that we're not going to properly learn from this. The public isn't going to be educated uh, correctly on this. We saw the same thing with the lockdown. So uh, that's why I, that's what I'm worried about. I'm, I'm worried about having to wait in line for gas this summer. Oh, that's a great point. When I moved back here, I thought, wow, there's all these lines in America now. Like, I just, I, growing up, I didn't have lines in Tampa for stuff, and now there's stuff. I mean, we have a baby, we buy formula occasionally, and it's, there's none. And then it's locked up behind a gate, and you have to get one per person, and it's, it's, it's in, I mean, I was like, this is, is this socialism, or what am I living through right now in Tampa, Florida? Um, but yeah, I, I'm, for me, I'm not, I'm not scared because if, I think that we just have a, a parallel, we have parallel societies existing next to each other. And you're not gonna learn in public school 
how to survive and, and thrive in America. You're just, you're gonna have to use the internet. It's only people that are willing to educate themselves every day that go online and learn and then join groups like this where they can discuss with other people to discuss ideas and how to navigate you know, living in in social, living under socialism, uh, you know, or, or going in that direction. So for me, I just see two societies. Um, more and more, the, the the kind of mainstream news and ideas, and, and it's sad because, like, in, in where I moved, where I lived in Europe, you know, when nobody's tolerant in 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 the in the European village, when you see somebody doing something that's not considered normal you would like bash them right away. You know, like the old grandma comes up and says, what are you thinking? What, what are you doing? You know, and they like social pressure to, for you to do what's been done for thousands of years or whatever. And maybe you can say that's bad or good, but here everybody's like, oh, who knows what their background story is? Let's just be tolerant and just, you know, oh, okay, well that's how they wanna, you know, live their life. Well, that's, you know, that's them. And I basically live here like that where I just, don't, you know, get involved with other people's lives if they, you know, say that, you know, they, they uh, have certain ideas. I just go on with my own ideas and I follow my own path. And, and it's kind of sad because I think it's the breakdown of society and, and, and I feel isolated, you know, like I can only come to a Mises event to feel community or, you know, go online in order to feel community. So for me, I just see two parallel societies and, and, and the decrease of the middle class here as as the you know people basically do what they're told and do what they've been told um you know by by the media and by this the public education system and then there's the group of people that are just kind of completely skirting that and, and doing what you know they think works and, and uh and they're doing all right in america so yeah, I'm 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 optimistic for you know the people that can use the internet now. It's it's widespread. Anyone with access to the internet can go online and learn about liberty and and technologies that allow you to live you know a, a life filled with liberty. Um, but for the rest of the average person, I I, I don't think anyone's going to help them out. You know, not not at least not the government. Yeah. So. Um... Revolutions are extremely risky for revolutionaries, and they generally understand this. Um, you know, it's very common that a revolution backfires. Uh, you could argue it's actually standard. Uh, the left was, they were choking us. They had our throat. They have for arguably since the Pendleton Act, so 150 years. Uh, they were winning, man. We were, I mean, we were down to our last couple of breaths, and these idiots decided that instead of just finishing us off, they would launch a revolution. And <laughs> I'm, you know, we were talking about this yesterday. I mean, it's shocking. Uh, he, he was almost dead. Just keep doing what you were doing. They had every instrument. They're brainwashing generation after generation. They held all of the commanding heights in our entire society, except for us. We're like the remnants. Uh, and that's when they decided to launch the revolution. And, you know, God bless them. Uh, so at this point, the Overton window is wide open. And once you do that, once you crack that open, right, once, you know, we've been living this sci-fi world the past two years, and a lot of people have opened up to a range of possibilities. And I think, you know, A, th th this is the battle. Uh, I mean, we need to be here right now. The stakes went up tremendously. We didn't ask for it. In retrospect, we probably should have. <laughs> if you're losing, um, you may as well go for the final battle, you know. <laughs> if you're getting weaker and weaker every year, do it early. Don't wait. Uh, so they brought it. And so absolutely, I think that we actually have the opportunity now because people see it with their eyes. It's getting bad so fast, right? Uh, you know, baby formula, Biden's endless series of, of uh, whatever it is he does. Uh, so if they bring the price controls, if they're going to bring all that, bring it now, immediately, because the, our side is woke. It's, they've always burnt police stations. They didn't wake up from anything. Our side is the one that woke up. Patrick, you mentioned that you know, one of your fears is that people not learning the right lessons from this. Um, I, I know one of the things that always comes up after meetings like this is, you know, what can we do with this? And so I guess I, I want to get perspective from you three. How should we talk to other people? about this money issue, right? So, you know, if, you know it, it's, it's, you know, I know some people, you know, if the answer is, oh, we'll just, you know, buy a ton of gold or Bitcoin, whatever. H how should we be you know, trying to get other people to understand why this money issue is so important 
and that there are ways out of it. Well, what would some, be some suggestions you guys have? Well, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I, I've noticed uh, it's easy to talk about it. Uh, I, I have, um, you know, they know about the rising price of gasoline. I mean, it's back. Uh, they know about the rising price of gasoline. Some of them have had to pay higher rents. This is a rude awakening for many college graduates this year. Uh, they wanted to live in some dream cities. Uh, they're going to find out that's not going to be so affordable to live in New York City by yourself. Uh, you know, in a one bedroom or even in Tampa or anything like that. I, I really think the, the best way is to um, short articles, videos, just explaining, uh, even when I've shown them, I've been on the news talking about inflation, just really hammer home the point about the Federal Reserve and the money supply and it's it, it, in, in, in showing people how these actions resulted from the past. So just from two years ago, that this is something people have been arguing, uh, this is what people said would happen, uh, the lockdowns were, you couldn't finance them this way, you're going to see high inflation as a result. And I've just felt the basic communication, teaching about the principles of monetary expansion, that uh, at least for me, has, has worked in just interesting some students, some people about inflation. Where now there's just people who know about inflation. When there's people who know about inflation, there's people who are upset about inflation. And when there's people who are upset about inflation, they're going to notice that uh, come the fall. So I already sort of consider that a little minor victory. Uh, the other thing I would say is make sure they read Dr. Murphy's book, right? Uh, it's a great way to learn about inflation and money. Uh, and, you know, so, so there, there's another plug, right? Yeah. Uh, that's great. Uh, yeah, definitely. I, on my side, I've already hired a Mises alum at, in the company where I work. So uh, I'm the director, so I've been able to put on my Facebook, anybody that wants to get paid in crypto, live off crypto, come join us. And, and uh, I had so many applications from Mises alum, and I try to get in, new person, one per quarter. Um, and then they, they live off crypto. I mean, they have, I'm sure they have other you know, side hustles and everything, but um, a big chunk of their salary is paid in cryptocurrency. So I think a lot of young people are naturally going towards cryptocurrency because they they can find jobs that are high paying. I mean, you know, if you, if you work even if you work for Ethereum Foundation based in Switzerland, you get paid in Ethereum living in Tampa, Florida, you're earning a, a good salary, you know, almost a Swiss salary or a salary that you could earn in New York if you worked on uh, in Wall Street. You know, you you could earn a, a decent salary actually without you know, uh, doing, you know, 80 hours a week at Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley. So uh, there's a lot of people that are, that would go towards the traditional finance route that are going instead towards uh, the cryptocurrency market. And I think that, uh, you know, once you get into the cryptocurrency market, you automatically learn about, you know, Austrian economics and sound money and uh, libertarian ideas and the idea of liberty. So I think that just the money aspect is going to attract a lot of people to these ideas. Yeah, and um, so I would agree with Patrick, definitely. Um, a lot of these topics are much more salient, um, you know, just because of the news cycle, right? So uh, people actually care about inflation, whereas before they just saw it as some abstract. If inflation's 2%, most people just do not care. Um, you can try to do the long chart. Yeah, your money's lost. It just doesn't work. Uh, it's working uh, a lot better now, particularly if their personal experience contradicts some official line. I mean, that's just pure magic, and you just want to grab that thread and pull that out of the sweater. Um, the other argument that seems to be a lot more salient uh, for people is the starve the beast argument, right? That, you know, fiat, um, I mean, it's, it's pretty close to, I think, half of government spending at this, time, at, at, at this point. Uh, you know, it is, uh, it's, it's the government has the ability to basically just take all of the, you know, pieces they want off the board. Um, and so just, you know, sort of highlighting for people uh, how fiat plays such a large role in that moving resources from the private sector to the public sector. And at the moment, people can, again, they can see it quite saliently. And I think one of the things that makes, I think, the, the current moment e even more terrifying than, than the 70s is that, you know, in the 70s you had, you know, uh, you, you, Charles de Gaulle threatening the U.S. by withdrawing gold, right? You, you had international uh, uh, you know, power, you know, people in power trying to compete with what America was doing, where it seems now we have 
a global environment of central bankers that have all been kind of following the same Kool-Aid, and in many cases going even further what the Fed has done and their craziness, which I think is, goes to why the dollar is still king. Um, are there any areas, whether it be with, within the U.S., be it internationally, where, where you think that you see some changes within the institutions in a way uh, uh, that, that might demonstrate that it's not simply the public waking up to the dangers of what government has done to our money, um, but that, that there are, are institutions at play that are taking significant steps to perhaps help pivot towards a, a depoliticized monetary future. And Peter, since you've been nodding along, I'll let you start with that one. Yeah, there are a couple of sort of um, interesting uh, events within that. So one of them is uh, the best performing, or one of the best performing currencies of the year has been the Russian ruble. Uh, because they have sort of dirty backing with gold. It's, it's a bit, it's not exactly backed by gold, but um, it's towards that direction. At any rate, uh, the ruble, there's um, open questions as to what they'll do with it in future once the war is over, um, but that, that's sort of brought that a little bit closer to the Overton window. Uh, Switzerland, of course, um, I think there's a large constituency in Switzerland. Uh, they just went off gold in, I think, 92, that they eliminated the last um, remnants of their gold backing. So um, point being that I think gold is not as far away as we imagine if things get bad enough. Uh, there's also some other experiments like uh, Bitcoin legal tender uh, in El Salvador, recently in Central African Republic. I believe the president there is actually a PhD economist, uh, which I was not aware. Uh, but at any rate, um, those are rather interesting. Bitcoin is still a speculative um, uh, asset, so that's not really having much of a money impact yet. But still, in terms of the Overton window opening up, is quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, oops. Oh, okay, on that note, um, actually, uh, I saw that Russia said that they are willing to accept Bitcoin for oil purchases. So there is there is a, you know, in addition to two countries uh, making Bitcoin legal tender, also uh, many different parts of the U.S. trying to do uh, positive policies for Bitcoin um, and, and many countries around the world. I do think that there's a big, you know, push towards looking at what can the government actually take custody of uh, themselves if they hold uh, reserve assets. I mean, with you know, with basically the, the, the U.S. freezing uh, uh, Russia's reserve assets, I mean, not the U.S., but the, you know, the G7, I mean, that basically, you know, weaponized uh, the SWIFT system and, and, the, and the U.S. dollar. And I think that any country that wants to do anything uh, that, that the U.S. might not agree with, they're first going to have to get rid of all their their treasuries and all their exposure to the U.S. dollar before they do that. Otherwise, it's going to be frozen and then it's going to stop them in their tracks. So I think you know we're going towards a, a kind of you know a, you know two monies. You know we're going to have the countries that side with the U.S. and do what the U.S. wants. We're going to have China and the countries that side with China. And then there's going to be all these countries in between that want to do trade with both, or they have reasons why they want to stay neutral, and they're going to have to use a, a third monetary system and, and, you know, go back to kind of this idea of a third world, um, you know, not, not the Soviet Union and not, not, not the U.S., um, not, but now it's going to be, I think, China. And those countries, I think, can look at, the, at Bitcoin and digital assets because you don't have to keep your assets in London or uh, Switzerland or Singapore near a gold market. You can keep them in your own private wallet held in your own country, um, you know, and nobody has access to that. Um, I also, you know, just set up my IRA here in the U.S. for the first time, and I can hold Bitcoin and keep custody of my own Bitcoin in my IRA. So nobody can touch my IRA, you know, if, if I mean, that's amazing for me because I didn't want an IRA with stocks that, that the government could just say, oh, that's mine now or, you know, in, 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 a, in a crisis. So I, I'm, I think there's a lot of opportunities for Bitcoin um, and, other, and other digital currencies. Um, so, I, you know, overall, I think there's a huge momentum behind it. The, the, um, it's just a matter of time, really. Um, if, you, if you go back and you look at statistically, you know, there, there was between 2014 and 2022, if you held on to your Bitcoin for at least three years, you had a 100% chance of positive return. So if you go in and out, you know, there's a lot of intraday volatility and, and intraweek volatility. But if you hold for the long term and just 
convert it into dollars that you need to spend, you know, keep the six month savings of dollars and then keep the, the rest in, in long term assets. You know, I, I think it's a great uh, for me. It's it's it makes me sleep sound at night knowing I can get on a plane to Switzerland or, you know, go wherever I need to go and, and, and you know, provide for my family with with that that asset with me all the time. Um, and it's not relying on anyone. So, and I think a lot of other countries are are, are realizing that as uh, as now as now they've seen that the U.S. is willing to do whatever it takes to you know force their foreign policy. Um, I think the Ukraine war uh, has at least led to a, a fissure among nations where you're seeing uh, maybe some potential movement to a separate currency uh, block uh, with China and Russia in the Middle East and India and then the United States and uh, Europe. Uh, and then everything else in between. So you're starting to see that uh, th that emerge. Even though the dollar has done very well, if you had to hold one asset this year so far, it's it's you know it's 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 uh, it's it's the greenback. The dollar's done very well. But uh, there there was an interesting article that came out. I believe it was by Barry Eichengreen, um, uh, talking about how the share of dollars held as international uh, reserves uh, in central banks and other institutions it has declined over the past 20 years from I think like 70% to 59% something something of that nature and it's not a, a it's not a drastic crash but that's 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 noticeable slippage right the dollar will have its ups and downs and will be up during these periods of economic uncertainty but you know the American Empire the the, the Pax Americana that that's long gone so people are waking up to the American institutions and they're seeing that okay uh, the, this um, the the dollar the, the the American economy it's not immune to inflation etc. You're seeing this more and more in Wall Street. Uh, Wall Street's realized this that okay they got inflation wrong, um, and I think you're starting to see now the articles are popping up, which means it's going to be the standard narrative that inflation's oh, the the new target may be above two percent right. Uh, the Fed could say, well, 4% is the best one. We were wrong all these years. So, you know, all we got to do is knock inflation down a couple percentage points uh, from e supply shocks easing. And then, you know, this will be the new normal, right? And I think people are going to be more uncomfortable with that new normal, uh, which could be a potentially uh, positive sign. Right, We've we got time for, I think, one more quick lightning round. I'm going to put you guys on the spot. Do you think Jay Powell has the courage to have a Volcker moment, or do you think we're going to end up seeing a, a pivot? For, so for all the blustering that they're going to get really serious about inflation, do you, do you think it's go they're going to end up chickening out, or do you think that, that we are going to actually see some, some confidence from Powell uh, to, to, for, for a correction, if you will? Uh, necessity uh, is the mother of bravery, and so he is no, he's going to chicken out until things get bad enough, and then at that point he'll do what needs to be done, but there's going to be a lot of pain before here and there. No, I think he's going to chicken out too. I mean, if you, if you, and traders do too. If you look at the DXY index, it just flipped, you know, yesterday for the first time towards downwards trends. So I, I think that markets don't suspect that they're going to keep raising rates. It's, for me, you have to raise rates a little bit to show you're doing your job just so that you can lower them again, because that's all you can afford. So, I mean, it's just the, it's just the bluff. I, I really don't think it's going to be long-term interest, uh, interest rate increases. Um, but, you know, in, in preparation for that, um, I, I've done a lot of diversification, and I also do market-neutral strategies, you know, that can uh, survive that market. But I, I don't think it's going to last. He'll chicken out, at least until November. So. <laughs> Excellent. Well, this has been the absolute state of money. So thank you very much for, uh, for being out here today.